You're watching NBC Super Channel. Your attention, please. Prepare to enter the site. Tonight on the site, how voices from death row were being heard around the world on the internet. Most of the people on death row are fairly normal. Most guys here are not slobbering lunatics or cold-blooded killers. Meet the man who pioneered internet publishing. And find out how to keep your computer from becoming obsolete before it's time. Plus the site of the night. Digital Dev answers your questions. And site essayist Cliff Stoll compares computers and tomatoes. There's just two things that you can't buy in life. Love and homegrown tomatoes. Reporting from San Francisco, Soledad O'Brien. Hello and welcome to the site for Monday, October 21st. You're watching us on television. We're also on the World Wide Web at site.msnbc.com or www.thesite.com. Let's go right to Craig Miller with the news. Craig? Well, thanks, Soledad. Apple is pinning some high hopes on a new PowerPC microprocessor unveiled just today. This new chip made by Exponential Technology clocks in at a fairly amazing 533 megahertz. That's faster than anything Intel makes or has plans to make next year. The fastest chip now is 225 megahertz. Apple is one of uh, Exponential's investors and plans to start putting the chips in its power PCs by the second half of next year. Cupertino execs are counting on the extra muscle to finally give them a leg up on its Intel-based competition. Also today, Apple finally showed us its new line of power books, and we'll show you in just a couple of minutes. Tis the season for quarterly reports, and two heavyweights are hyping theirs today. IBM came in with profits of $1.3 billion for its third quarter. That didn't impress Wall Street, which bid uh, Big Blue's stock down for most of the day anyway, before it finally closed up a tad. Microsoft also has good news to report. Net profits of $614 million for its first quarter. That's about 23% better than this time a year ago when Windows 95 was hot off the press. And further evidence the stock market could care less, Microsoft closed down as well today. Now, should electronic middlemen be allowed to sell sports updates via Beeper? That's the question put before the U.S. Court of Appeals today by Motorola and Stats Incorporated, an electronic provider of sports scores. If you have the service, Stats supplies a, a pager-like device made by Motorola. On a little readout, you get the latest scores minute by minute, or even, as with pro basketball, dunk by dunk, as it were. The NBA won an injunction to stop the service several weeks ago, saying it's too close to the play-by-play -play that broadcasters pay big bucks for the rights to. Stats and Motorola say they're just updating sports information. Now, with less than two weeks to the start of the NBA season, it's up to a panel of three circuit court judges in Manhattan to figure out whether to let the injunction stand. We should mention that NBC has a four-year contract to broadcast NBA games and has filed legal briefs in support of the injunction. Well, if you're a reader of the online magazine Slate, you'll be getting a free ride longer than you thought. Slate, the much-talked-about webzine headed by Michael Kinsley and published by Microsoft, was supposed to start charging an annual subscription rate of $19.95 on November 1st. That's now been extended until February because they haven't figured out how to bill you yet. All right, now let's take a look at some bits from today's digital domain. Make my bed and light the light I will arrive a little late tonight Blackbird, bye-bye Bird, bye-bye One more time Black We all reports here now with a preview, a one-minute preview of the new power book. Yeah, take a look at this. This is the uh, 1400 
uh, which is codenamed Epic. And yeah. by the way, look long and hard because you're not going to see another one of these in the stores probably for some time, some months. <laughs> they're due out middle of next month, but there won't be a lot of them around. But basically. mainly because yeah. there's such pent-up demand for power books. It's been a yeah. while since Apple's had a new one on the market. And now, this is a power PC. Power PC, 603E, yeah. 117 megahertz. That's pretty fast. But compared to the 5300, which was the first power book that well, power that's PC. That's the biggest uh, change. It's a speeder, the, the other speedier machine, the other big change, and they're finally they're actually playing catch-up with the Windows mm -hmm. laptops now. They have a CD-ROM built there in right go. here. Built-in CD-ROM. First Macintosh PowerBook with a CD-ROM. A little built bigger in. display. 11.3 inch active matrix or mm -hmm. dual scan passive matrix display. And it actually looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And there's one other big differentiator. Yeah. This is the part I like. They spent some time <laughs> on this. This, I don't know if you can see this. This comes off. It doesn't matter how good it is. This is the no, reason people the, will buy it here. This is the good thing. And you can got, put little uh, artworks of art here. In fact, you have some of the cards. Yeah, yeah. It comes with a dozen. You can uh, choose from, uh, you know, about a dozen different and that ways to personalize slides right on personalize your uh, your power book there. no more gray yeah. power book or i suppose you could make your own well there you are isn't that lovely that lovely uh, i don't know what that is stone eye price There's also range on this we're thing talking now about twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred dollars basically yeah. apple's playing catch up with the windows right. notebook market which is a lot that price range is a lot less than the it's uh, less than the fifty they're in they're okay. pretty much competitive thank you leo you're welcome all right coming up next on the site dead man talking online from death row do you want the leather cover this is really nice You're watching NBC, where the stars come out at night. Tonight on National Geographic Television. Head east to a land of legend and mysticism. On the island of Bali, life is a gift from the gods, an endless cycle of creation and destruction. The people give almost everything to the gods, their labor, their art, their income, life itself. A guide to the island's ancient spirits and sacred traditions in Bali, masterpiece of the gods. National Geographic Television. Tonight at 1700 on NBC. On tomorrow's European Money Wheel, we head for the cinemas to take a look at Europe's film industry. And why men are winning the battle of the sexes with their pay packets. Join us tomorrow. On the European Money Wheel. behind prisons is to separate the criminal element from the rest of society. Well, now the internet is providing new ways for folks behind bars to reach a global audience, and it's creating new controversies as well. How are you, puppy? George and Helen Cullen's lives changed forever in 1984. It was the year their 25-year-old daughter, Janet, was strangled to death by Dean Philip Carter in Oceanside, California. Collins was Carter's fourth victim in a murder spree that began in Los Angeles earlier that year. By 1991, Carter was on death row at San Quentin Prison after being arrested and convicted of all four murders. George Collins says that conviction should have been the final word on Carter's fate. But in January of this year, Collins discovered a new dialogue had begun. Most of the people on death row are fairly normal. Most guys here are not slobbering lunatics or cold-blooded killers. One of the difficult things is to keep your perspective and not let yourself become overwhelmed by the incredible pressure and stress that you have to deal with. The words belong to Dean Philip Carter, and they transcend prison walls by way of the web. Eleven of Carter's letters have been posted on the Internet by San Francisco radio personality and death penalty opponent Alex Bennett. Bennett, who refused to be interviewed on camera, calls his site Dead Man Talkin' and says he asked Carter to write about life on death row as a way to educate the public. George Cullens contends that Carter has a broader agenda. I vehemently deny committing the crimes that I am sitting here on death row for. He said he was innocent, innocent of all charges. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with him being on the net. Don't get me wrong. 
I just want the truth out there. To that end, Cullen started a website of his own in March and named it for his daughter. Justice Against Crime, Janet Ann Cullens. You click on First, he designed a link from his here. site to Dead Man Talkin', and then he wrote up. rebuttals to Carter's claims. Uh, Realize that Carter was tried in three courts in front of three juries, and the procedure was overseen by three judges, and he was found guilty of all offenses. Today, Cullen's website serves as a clearinghouse for pro-death penalty articles and organizations. He also uses a net to petition state legislators to speed up the appeals process in capital cases. As any parent knows, if a child commits an offense at 9 o'clock in the morning, you don't correct him two weeks later or a month later for that offense. Our court system does that. Cullen's fears that given enough time and enough exposure on the internet, inmates like Carter could change their fate by changing public opinion, whether or not what they write is true. Ironically, new controversial regulations set forth by the California Department of Corrections, regulations designed to curb prisoner access to the public, could increase the significance of inmate postings online. The Department of Corrections has proposed rules that would, number one, eliminate all face-to-face -face interviews with specific prisoners, with named prisoners, and number two, would eliminate the previous confidentiality of mail to the news media. Journalists call the prison media ban censorship. The Department of Corrections calls it a security measure. The new rules are currently under review by the state government and are expected to become prison law on October 28th. Peter Sussman is the president of the Northern California chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. He says what happens in California could spark a chain reaction across the country. At a time when pun crime and punishment issues are on the top of the public agenda, when the department is under attack in the courts, for really barbaric practices, and when the department is keeping records from the public. At that very time, they're trying to ban media access to the prisons. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to journalists, and it should be unacceptable to the public. Sussman says with other media channels closed, the Internet will become the dominant way inmates will be able to communicate with the public. And as the Internet becomes more powerful, so too will activists with websites, a fact that Sussman admits worries him. The more information is hidden, the more it creeps, crawls, or thunders through some other outlet. And the internet right now is that outlet because everyone has access to the means for communicating that information to the world. The danger in that is that the information may not be reliable. It may be tainted. I've been trying to ensure that the material I have is accurate, that it contains information that's valuable to everybody, and that it doesn't reflect a completely ideological bent. Arnold Erickson is a staff attorney at the prison law office outside San Quentin. He developed an independent website more than a year ago. Today, his prison law page has garnered top reviews from internet writers and critics nationwide. We're being asked to pay for bond measures. We're being asked to essentially define what constitutes a criminal justice system. And the more that we understand the criminal justice system, what goes on inside of prisons, the better I think those choices we'll be able to make. Erickson's site contains extensive articles about prisoners' rights and related legislation. And he does post the writings of those on the other side of the wall. And particularly, I've had a number of stories that have been written by Michael Hunter, who's a death row prisoner in California. Hunter murdered his stepmother and father in 1981 and has been awaiting execution for 10 years. All through the yard, I see the ghosts of victims screaming, crying, threatening, and imploring condemned men for an explanation of why they had to die. Some prisoners try to walk away while others try to communicate an answer, only to discover that for some actions, perhaps, there are no explanations, no second chances, and no resolutions. I think you have to look at what people are saying and whether it's something that you feel comfortable putting out under your name and taking responsibility for. Fact-checking is something that we, we strive to do as much as we can. Um, but again, we have to put out a lot of disclaimers. Eli Rosenblatt is a human rights activist in San Francisco. He oversees a site called the Prison Issues Desk. Rosenblatt says he receives box loads of inmate letters and he posts the ones that will advance his group's agenda. We do a whole lot of editing. 
to try and figure out what's going to be most effective in changing the the public's mind about the the tragedy that is the prison system today. And they've been successful. Activists like Rosenblatt played a pivotal role in one of the most hotly contested convictions in our nation's history. That of former Black Panther Party member Mumia Abu Jamal. Jamal was sentenced to death for the killing of a Philadelphia police officer in 1981, a charge he denies. Top legal experts say Jamal's trial was flawed. August 17th of last year, Mumia was scheduled to be executed. And the reason that he was not, largely, was because public pressure forced the judge to reconsider. I have no doubt that the work that we did online uh, helped create that, that public opinion. If the power of the internet is a cause for celebration among some prison activists, it is a cause for concern among some crime victims who say they have access to fewer websites and are not as well organized. And as the battle to win public opinion wages on, those behind bars may wield the most powerful weapon. That's it for this time. I'm sure that most of what I talk about in this is dry and boring, but I felt that it was important to talk about it. Sorry, later Dean. I'm sorry also. I wish he wasn't there on death row and my daughter was alive. Just in the past two weeks, victims, rights groups, and prisoner advocates have both scored legal victories. In California, Governor Pete Wilson signed a new law that speeds up the appeals process. And in Philadelphia, a key prosecution witness who placed Mumia Abu-Jamal at the murder scene recanted her story, adding credence to the online efforts of Jamal's defenders. This is a tug of war that is a long way from being over. Up next, Sight of the Night. Don't go away. Would you like a tour of our website? Well, let's go, friends. Type in thesite.msnbc.com and voila, it's our very own homepage. Click on the front page and go straight to work, to play, to home or world. In each section, you'll find more information about all of our stories on the air, plus more. Or click on TV tonight. Here you'll find our program schedules, hot links to other sites, factoids, email addresses, etc. Last but not least, click on the bin. You can send your very own email to Soledad, to Cliff, even to yours truly. The Dev Master. Yeah, baby, send me some mail. I'll write right back to you. Still confused? Just click tour the site from the front page. We'll take you through the whole Megillah step by step. So let your fingers do the walking, let your brain do the talking. Watch out for Mr. Cranky. He's really mean. He's got a big, big ego. Later with Greg Kinnear, weeknights at midnight on NBC.
Romance, excitement, art, fashion, good food and wine. Visit Paris, you'll find it all. View the fabulous city from the Eiffel Tower and sample some of the excellent cuisine. How's this for a starter? European Living, tonight at 1800 on NBC. Tonight is chosen by our web team and their colleagues at our corporate sister, Yahoo. Tonight, Nirav Tolia is back to give us a tour of his pick, which is... Where are we? It's a virtual voyage of Route 66. <laughs> and as many of our viewers know, Route 66 is a historic stretch of highway. Mm -hmm. It spans 2,200 miles. It starts in Chicago, ends in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and there are eight states in between. So, just in case you actually haven't made that road trip yourself, <laughs> we're going to go on the virtual voyage. Okay. This is a site that was put together by the Houston Chronicle, and these are two journalists of the Houston Chronicle, and they actually just went on a road trip and wrote about their experiences, took a lot of pictures, and brought it back for us to see. And they did the stories for the Houston Chronicle? That's correct. They actually wrote the stories as well, because if we go here to stories from 66, like I said, this was done by the Houston Chronicle, so most of the content is story-related. Mm -hmm. And you go here and you see Mark Evangelista, Houston Chronicle Interactive, and this is the full text, just like you'd find in any other newspaper. It's but, so interesting because it says Houston Chronicle Interactive. I wonder if they also ran the articles at the same time for the Houston Chronicle. That would be interesting because they're one of the few papers that have tried to really differentiate themselves online and mm -hmm. have a strong online presence instead of just mirroring the text that they have in the paper. Anyway, let's, let's go on down here to roadside attractions because, you know, pictures are always a little more exciting than text. <laughs> so here are some of the roadside attractions they saw on the route. One of my favorite, the Cross of the Plains. I'm from West Texas, and as you <laughs> and can see... And this is pretty much West Texas. This is definitely West Texas. Very flat, the Bible Belt. And just in case you forgot that God was watching over you, we have the big cross <laughs> here. A big reminder. That's right. Another, another one of the cool pictures is uh, right here, down and dirty. And this is a bunch of uh, cars. It's called Cadillac okay. Ranch. And they've been put in the ground like this, and you get off Route 66, and you can actually go on and color them with your markers and add graffiti and all that sort of thing. So this so, is sort of off Route 66, not... This one is actually, it says, though not really on Route 66, but it is one of the most famous tourist attractions, so a lot of people get off and take a look at it. Now, if you're, if you're not driving and you are in the back seat, you're a back seat driver. And this just happens to have a back seat driver cam. And what we have here is they put a camera in the back seat and they started to take a picture of all the places they went. This is a nice little slideshow. It goes through automatically. It looks like so, yeah, you can, you can act like you're in the back seat, you know, grab a Coke, some <laughs> chips, and just sort of hang out, you know, see what's going on here. So that was one of the neat things on here, too. Do they have an interactive portion where you can um, write back to them? Or? They actually have a quiz. The most interactive yeah. part of it is the trivia quiz right here. You can you can click on that, and it has all these questions like who wrote the song Route 66 and who wrote where the does song it go? Route 66. I don't know. How does that song I go? I don't know. Do you know? Can can you hum a few bars? But here we have right here who wrote the song Get Your Kicks on Route 66, and we can click on the answers, but. For all our viewers, we don't want to spoil it for them, so we won't <laughs> click on the answers or for now. Or bore them with it. Or bore them, the right. Alternately bore them. So none of us can hum. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm not trying to sing. I'll tell you that much. Um, another really neat thing is this virtual 66. Now, one of the newest technologies on the Internet is QuickTime Virtual Reality. So if we go in here, we have the Grand Canyon, which is one of the stops on the route. This is a really neat technology. It's QuickTime VR once again. And as you can see, I'm scrolling around the screen. So it's as if wow. you got out of the back seat. You actually <laughs> stopped at the Grand Canyon, and now you're looking around. That's so really so nice. with this site, you can really you know, get a feel for what Route 66 is like. You don't if have it, to do the route. If you're you too lazy to actually on. road trip, you can click on it. And what does any good driver do after he goes on a road trip? He shares his experiences with other drivers. Great. So the last thing we have here is the Hyper News Group, where you can share your experiences. Nira, thanks so much for being with us once again. We'll be back right after this. Sorry, go away. National Geographic, Saturdays at 1900 on NBC. I hope this will be as exciting for viewers to watch as it will be for me to do, because they're going to be a part of it. You're going to be participating in this show through the Internet. It the audience an opportunity to participate. It's kind of a revolution in terms of the way television has been done. You know, I'm confined in most of my interviews to about five minutes at the most, but here I'll have a whole hour. We'll make use of the Internet. We'll make use of the phone. Uh, we'll make use of face-to-face -face dialogue. In a show like this, everybody's the host. In tonight, tonight at 2 on NBC. On tomorrow's European Money Wheel, we head for the cinemas to take a look at Europe's film industry. And why men are winning the battle of the sexes with their pay packets.
Join us tomorrow. On the European Money Wheel. Once again, to answer some of our viewers' burning questions ow, here. Ow, ow, <laughs> All right, Jeff, you need to know that uh, I've been getting a lot of posts on my message board about how rude and obnoxious uh, you are what? to me. me? So what? just watch it. Rude just about what? Watch it. Yes, okay, you ready? Nah. Lori right. and Charlie. Yes. Hi, just moved to Hi. Tucson from Fall River. Okay. And their local cable station, TCI, does mm -hmm. not carry MSNBC. But here's their oh, question. Here. Well, wait Have a minute. you ever wait heard. A minute. Wait a minute. They're asking a question, but they can't get the show? So whatever we say, <laughs> they can't hear? We'll email them this as well. This is smart. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard of PC DOS? Yes. I've looked everywhere, and when I ask where people look at me, like I have two heads. Signed. Lori and Charlie. Who have two <laughs> heads. You're, there's, there's two of you. You have two heads. Anyway, PC DOS is IBM's version of MS DOS. They still sell it. If you have an IBM brand name computer, then you might want to use uh, PC DOS. Otherwise, MS DOS is just fine for the rest of us. Okay, Davin yeah. writes, I'm wondering if there's been any talk about Netscape 4.0. Oh, yes. Not only talk, they uh, actually did something about it last week. They put the first pre-release version of 4.0 on their web servers. Now, of course, if you're, uh, if you're not the experimental type, I'd stick with the release version of 3.0. You'll be much better off. But 4.0 is available. And now 5.0 is in the works. And Microsoft, of course, is going to ship 4.0 their browser because, well, they got to keep up and... Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, story. yeah, yeah. Okay, Dean writes, what peripheral do you use to get the image on the big screen TV? Oh, actually, that's a beautiful TV, isn't it? That's our Sony RVP 4015Q. And maybe if I keep saying that, they'll send me one. <laughs> and we send it through a Sony DSC 1024 digital scan converter, which costs bazillion, trillion, trillion dollars. Like, so, really, how much does it cost? Eh, it's about 10 grand, so I don't think you're going to use it at home. Sure. Not for personal use, anyway. Okay, okay. letter from Perry. Deb, Hi, no. Is the year 2000 a leap year? A long, well, well, long involved. This is the question. Is, to, is the year 2000 a leap year? And then he goes into this whole thing about he's a computer programmer, trying to figure out leap years. Ah. What's the algorithm? Well, I'm glad you asked the Deb, and I'll tell you the algorithm. <laughs> if the year is divisible by 4, but not divisible by 100, or if the year is divisible by 100, then it's a leap year. And in C, you'd express it as this expression below, year modulo 4 is equal to 0, and year modulo 100 not equal to 0, or year 400. And then the answer is, is yes. Um, why are they asking you this again? Uh, because <laughs> they, this guy's a nitwit. Why would you ask a cartoon character if the year 2000 is a leap year? Oh, that's Maybe a... he works for the IRS. <laughs> Did you hear that? That their computers are going to have big problems on uh, the year 2000 because it's... they're all screwed up. They can't go. They think 1900 is. But that's a story for another day. Another day. Thanks, Deb. Another time. <laughs> Back right bye after bye. this. Don't go away. I can't believe they think I insult you. I love you. You do insult me. No, I don't. No, you do. And then they think I, you can't take care of yourself. We can hear from my lawyer. Yourself. You know everyone in my family's a lawyer, right? Hey, those are my lawyers behind you, right there, the Bondi. <laughs> you see them? Mom and Pop Bondi. Uh huh. They're, they're, they're my lawyer. Profiler, Saturdays at 2100 on NBC. Our world events reported in the States. A fresh perspective from NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Weekdays only on NBC. From the NBC Weather Center, this is your European Forecast Planner. And I'm Tom Curine in the NBC Weather Center. And as we look at the forecast map for this Tuesday, a broad area of high pressure continues to bring delightful weather throughout most of Spain and into France and Germany, as well as northern Italy and even into uh, southern sections of Italy. Beautiful, by the way, uh, in Tel Aviv. High there today will be reaching 26 with lots of sunshine. Rome will be reaching 19. That high pressure also extending into uh, Germany. Berlin will be uh, reaching 15 with partly cloudy skies. And some rain perhaps in Warsaw. 
Warsaw, Budapest will be reaching uh, 15 with the partly cloudy skies. It'll be cloudy in London and Dublin, Oslo, and Stockholm, Chile, as well as in Helsinki with clouds and threat of rain showers there. I have only seven in Helsinki. That high pressure continuing to push into uh, most of the eastern sections of Europe as well, and into Austria, Vienna, reaching 14 with sunshine. I'm Tom Curai. You're watching NBC, where the stars come out at night. which means it must be time for Stupid Metrics. Metrics. And we've got three illustrious members of the site staff standing by to demonstrate their personal favorite Stupid Net Trick. Up first, Rene Arricchio, site producer. What's your Stupid Net Trick? Okay, so we'll add mm -hmm. my Stupid Net Trick. You see this? Bo yes. Clouds, boring. <laughs> Don't you agree? Yes, I Let's agree. Get some, you can take any picture off the net and make wallpaper out of it for your desktop. Okay. Now, let's see. What would be inspirational? Something that you'd like to see all the time. Perhaps a picture of Barbara Streisand. That was your favorite say. and mine here at the Barbara Streisand Music Guide, which is chocker block full of pictures of my favorite diva. Now, this is the modern Barbara, but, you know, Barbara's career spans over many decades. Let's go back in time now, shall we? We shall. How about My Name is Barbara 2, that album? Okay. I love that this is vintage Barbara. So you find the little gif, the picture, if you will, and you click into it, and you make it big like that. And then this right button here, you mm -hmm. always wonder what you do with that right button? Well, you can click like that, mm -hmm. and they have this little thing set as wallpaper. And you just click like that. Now watch this through the magic of television <laughs> squeeze down and look there's your screensaver wow that's pretty good only on internet explorer uh i think you can do it on netscape too okay. but you can't do it on like aol and CompuServe and all those guys wow not bad yeah don't want to use a picture from the 70s no no <laughs> you should never judge anybody by their hair from the 70s not fair let's skip the perm years okay thank you very much renee who Gotta is go. up next i believe we have erin english site researcher who's going to demonstrate her stupid net trick what's your trick well, it's called greeting cards, and I'm pretty lazy and cheap, so I'm really excited <laughs> to find out that I can send greeting cards for free on the internet. Here we have awesome cyber cards. So you have to go and, to their website. Yeah, go to your web the website, and you can send all occasion cards, weddings, condolences. <laughs> it's a little tacky to send someone condolences if someone's died, but... <laughs> Why don't but we just cheap. try? <laughs> it, it is free. So let's go to holiday. Right. What are we going to send? And I'm going to send you a Halloween card. Oh, great. That is beautiful. It's really, <laughs> isn't it pretty? <laughs> and all I got to do is two, two steps. steps. This is so easy. Personalize it. Put my name in. Mm -hmm. Opening greeting. You know, hi. That works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so excited, and I will get this Here, on my email. I'll show you. Here's a preview. Oh, we're running out of time for previews, so will I get this uh, in my email later today? Um, sure. And because I'm cheap too, I will send it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. All right, you're off. You're off. All Who's right. up next? Karsten. My turn. <laughs> okay, what do you have for us? Um, I have <laughs> something that. The, time, Steve, the clock is Steve, ticking. Steve, our director, was supposed to set up for me, but he didn't. Oh. I have virtual bubble wrap. Uh, What's virtual bubble wrap? It's uh, the online version of the best invention of the 20th century, <laughs> bubble wrap. <laughs> you pop bubbles. And that's it. That's the whole game. <laughs> it keeps your score. Wait, bring Aaron back. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I, wait, I don't get this. How does this work? Oh, Level two, girl. you just... You just, you, you just, I just cleared the level. You, and oh, so you pop all the bubbles and you, you win? You pop all the bubbles and you win. But they don't even time it? Um, no. Um, <laughs> and you keep going until... You lose your in, mind. Until you lose your mind. Or there, your people there who are share people, your cubicle kill are, you. The, the high scores in this game have gotten just under a million points. They went, went through 10,500 uh, levels. You get one point per bubble. Um, that is so tragic. What a waste of time and mental energy. <laughs> oh, my God. 
I can do but this But there's no hours. challenge here. <laughs> no, there's no challenge. Is that what you do all the time? Okay, we're getting you off. That's it. If you have a stupid net trick you'd like to send to us, it can't be any worse than this. So feel free to email us at thebin at cd.com. Maybe we will put it on the air. We'll be back right after this. Don't go away. Hey, Deb here. Say, wasn't that fun? You want to try it yourself? Well, it's easy. Just go to the site.com for links to all three stupid Net Trick web pages. But wait, there's more. Ten more to be exact. It's true. You'll get a web visitor bonus. Ten more equally dumb, dumb things to do online. Remember, this list is only available at the site.com. Tax and license not included. Contest may have settled during shipment. Member FDIC. You're watching NBC, where the stars come out at night. Tonight on National Geographic Television. Head east to a land of legend and mysticism. On the island of Bali, life is a gift from the gods, an endless cycle of creation and destruction. The people give almost everything to the gods, their labor, their art, their income, life itself. A guide to the island's ancient spirits and sacred traditions in Bali, masterpiece of the gods. National Geographic Television. Tonight at 1700 on NBC. Contributing editor Denise Caruso has been covering the computer revolution for more than a decade. Tonight she talks to one of the industry's early visionaries. His name is Brewster Kale. Brewster, welcome to the site. Thank you. So you've been getting a lot of publicity lately about your new company called Internet Archive, but before we start talking about that, um, let's talk about your background a little bit. You were one of the early people at a supercomputer company called Thinking Machines. Mm -hmm. And when I met you, you were working on a project called Waze for Wide Area Information Services. Um, what did Waze do? Was, it, was that actually the first search engine for the internet? Yeah, it was ability to make uh, information available around the world, able to be accessed by everyday people. It's the first system to be able to do that. So you would have on, on your screen, you would just get a little window up and you would type something in and it would go out and search the whole internet? Yes. And that was pretty much the first time anybody could do that? Yes. So, who was using that product? Um, at first it was researchers, universities, libraries were using this to get around the traditional bounds of paper to distribute information. And people uh, found it wildly useful. Found uh, people using it in their basements just to be able to publish information on stamp collections or all the different uh, political campaigns in 1992 we're using this technology to try to uh, distribute press releases in a more effective way. So and the internet was starting to happen sort of back in that era, even before the web. And who, who ended up being um, your customers for that product? Um, as it started to go commercial, the big publishers were all very interested. Why was that? Um, they had an ability, or they saw a promise of being able to get around the traditional bounds of publishing on paper by distributing via electrons to millions of people. And so this would let, let people find their information more easily? Yes. And it started to flip the equation so that the reader was starting to be in control. The reader could figure out what it is they wanted uh, rather than always having the newspapers or the television station saying, this is what it is you should be looking at. And did you find that at first when you would talk to them about this, they were sort of nervous about putting the reader in control? Oh, yes. When we <laughs> first talked with the imagine. Encyclopedia Britannica in 1985, the idea of making online versions of, the, of that material was frightening to them. But now they're on the net, and we helped put them on the net because they saw it as a, not only as a defensive maneuver, but as an offensive maneuver. How do you make your, your work really used? 
So the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Government Printing Office were all customers of ours because we were, I guess, one of the first website builders before there even was a web. Before there was, <laughs> how did you, just, just by virtue of the fact that you could do what you do on the web, which is just look at your screen and do it, you didn't have to know where it was beforehand? Right, right. It's just all the technologies are getting better and better for people to make their information available on the internet. And this was uh, a tool and technique that was predated the, the web and basically has been overcome by Gopher and now the World Wide Web and we'll probably see uh, further developments from here. So now you're building a company that's going to really be the mother of all archives. Um, you're going to archive the internet itself. What can you tell me about the scope of this project? What are we really talking about here? How much information are you trying to store? The internet archive is trying to build a complete store of what's available on the net over time. So you could go and replay what happened and do studies to find out what trends are happening, what, what things are changing, which are very difficult to do right now. And how much information is this? Let, let's try to figure out a way to describe it. So how, how much information is a book? A book is about a megabyte. A movie? Um, about a gigabyte. So it's about a thousand times more than a book. And the internet is between one and ten terabytes. So again, a thousand times larger try to put that in some sort of perspective, um, the whole Library of Congress, if you count all of the books, just the books in the Library of Congress, is about 20 terabytes. And the internet, though not all of its text, graphics and the like, it's on the order of 10 terabytes. And so, is this going to be a, a for-profit company, a non-profit? How are you going to be in business with this? The Internet Archive has got two, two pieces to it. One is a non-profit sector, um, which basically is responsible for gathering and storing the bits for long-term use. That's a charitable trust. So no one can have exclusive access or buy up right. uh, in the future our digital heritage. We think that that's very important. But we're also trying to show that this technology can be actively useful. And the best way to do that is doing that in a for-profit company where you can get investment and the certain different types of employees that are really trying to make this information base useful to everybody. But you're not really sure how people, how you're going to make money from this yet. I mean, who knows how anybody's going to make money on intellectual property, right? Correct. We're, we're, it's not exactly known. But the technologies for manipulating vast amounts of information on wide area networks has all the promise of, of a lot of the early PCs. We're now starting to see these vast collections being search through by just about everybody every day. So why are you doing this? Do, do people think you're crazy for trying to do this? Um, most people think we're crazy. They either think it's either impossible or pointless. Um, the people that think that it's impossible just think the net's too big and changing too much. And it's true, we're not going to be able to record it all. And when everybody's camcorder is on the net, it's true, we're not going to be able to record it all. But we should be able to uh, archive some of the important trends and information that's going on so you can look backwards in time. How much, what are some of the examples of the things that you've saved so far? Because you're already in process of doing this, right? Uh, we've saved all the presidential election websites and uh, have put together an exhibit with the Smithsonian that's now up at the Smithsonian of what the presidential election third party candidates looked like. Almost all of those are gone now. But they that's see it great. as they see it as important, as important as bumper stickers or the early TV political ads. A historical document. As historical document. And so when do you think you might have the first big chunk of this really done? In a few months? Um, we've got all the text of the internet, a couple different snapshots of the text, but we're now going back for all the graphics and all of the little video clips that are available out on the net. And by the end of 96, we hope to have a complete collection of what 96 looked like. Then the, then the challenge is keeping up with the changes. Well, we'll have you back so you can show us what it looks like then. Thanks for coming. It was really nice talking to you. Thanks, Denise. We'll be right back. Get Denise's complete interview with Brewster Kale over real audio or by transcript on our website at www.thesite.com.
Hey, Dan Mel here saying, time again for shareware of the day. Head for the front page at the site.com. That's where you'll find free shareware to download and try. Today's shareware, MedInsure Magic will do the work for you. Are you sick and tired of watching your medical insurance paperwork pile up? MedInsure Magic will do the work for you. Track your stacks of insurance claims. Record your medical history. Kiss chaos goodbye. Say hello to shareware of the day. On the front page at the site.com. Get it, it's free. Profiler, Saturdays at 2100 on NBC. Tonight on the Selena Scott Show, movie maverick Mike Figgis. I like writing because that's by yourself. I like all the doing bits. I like the bits where I use my energy. And editing, I once described it as being punished for having a good time. Plus, celebrated pianist Boris Beresovsky. The Selena Scott Show, tonight at 1900, in association with Soto Voce, by Laura Biagiotti Parfum, on NBC, where the stars come out at night. I hope this will be as exciting for viewers to watch as it will be for me to do, because they're going to be a part of it. You're going to be participating in this show through the internet. Gives the audience an opportunity to participate. Kind of a revolution in terms of the way television has been done. You know, I'm confined in most of my interviews to about five minutes at the most, but here I'll have a whole hour. We'll make use of the internet, we'll make use of the phone, uh, we'll make use of face-to-face of -face dialogue. Like this, everybody's the host. In Tonight, tonight at 2 on NBC. Joining us now is Robin Raskin. She is editor-in-chief of Family PC Magazine, and she also knows that technology is changing so rapidly that it's easy to feel that your brand new PC is somehow becoming obsolete very quickly. Is this just perceived, or is this really true? There are probably five new chips out since we started talking, but no, I, I don't think it's perceived. I think if you ask anybody who's about to buy a computer what's bugging them, they're afraid that this thing that they're shelling out a lot of money for will be obsolete by the time they bring it home. Or at least within two years, what they've got is a glorified plant stand. So why is this happening? Is it, is it the computer industry doing this to us consumers? Yeah, well, the computer industry has been great. It's done everything that we said we would do. We said we would double the processor speed every 18 months. We said that we would drop prices of chips um, concurrently with that every 18 months. That's all happened. The thing is, it's happened so fast. What you have now, if you go to look, look around at the market, you've got five flavors of Pentiums, including a Pentium 200 megahertz. You've got a Pentium Pro. You have MMX technology around the corner people are saying should I wait should I buy should I not buy they're absolutely terrified I believe to the point of paralysis and I think it's actually starting to hurt sales a little bit so I mean what do you do about that practically speaking because you're talking about a lot of money 2,500 bucks how yeah. do you go about I think that? I think we're at the point where we mature as an industry mm -hmm. and we look at um, things that you can do to kind of bring along this whole people who have bought PCs and made this investment so let's start you know start with the simplest thing upgrading your PC Everybody says, oh, yeah, you can buy this, and then you can upgrade it. Well, the fact of the matter is the upgrades that are available, mostly the Pentium overdrive chip, is only available, only works with certain kinds of machines. The pinouts on the chips have to be exactly right. It turns out when you benchmark it, you really don't get a full Pentium in your upgrade, but you get uh, somewhere around a DX4 machine. So, so you need... But basically, they mean to make the upgrades more accessible to everybody. Right, upgrades that work. Um, there actually is a company now called Nexar, and Nexar is coming out with a line of upgradable PCs where you'll be able to pull parts in and out very quickly. So there's, there's one example. The other is the infrastructure for upgrading. So I have this computer at home, and I'd like to upgrade it. Well, can I just bring it to the upgrade store? And you're starting to see these things. You walk in and say, I'd like a bigger hard drive. I'd like a, a better graphics board. Can you do this for me? But there's still too few and far between. What about um, software? 
Software is the same thing. I think you have these old 286s and 386s that are capable of things. No, they can't surf the internet, and they're not running the next great multimedia. But there are things that they can do. Maybe they can open your garage when you come home. Maybe they can turn on your house lights. Wouldn't it be so nice if a software vendor said, this software was made to work on your old machine? just expressly for that purpose. We're not saying it's going to have multimedia bells and whistles for you, and you could go in and buy this. I think people would do it, and then I think they'd go buy a new machine because they feel like the old machine wasn't bought in vain. What about the financial aspect? I mean, right now you're shelling out $2,500 at least to buy a computer. That's a lot of money. Is there a way to sort of restructure that? Yeah, I mean, think about when you make other expensive purchases in your life. You have options. You can lease. You can rent. You know, you can put money down. I think as we mature, uh, these kind of financing schemes, creative schemes, have to come up. You know, college loans. Get a replacement every two years. Now, wouldn't we like that? <laughs> Just get the latest technology delivered to your door. And I'm not asking anybody for charity. I'm saying that as an industry, there's money to be made in these sort of things. What can I do right now to protect myself four years down the road so I don't have my plant stand with right. my <laughs> Macintosh underneath it? I think, first of all, you know, it's the wake-up assumption. When we told people 15 years ago about computers, said, buy one and you'll be set forever. That's not true. You'll be set for a few years. So go in with your eyes open and then know at any given point your 2000 or $2,500 will buy you a certain amount of things. If I were going out today, it would be a Pentium 133 megahertz machine with a large hard drive, at least a gigabyte. So be realistic about what you're going right. to get. And get the most that your money can buy. You know, shopping at garage sales is great, but you know, only if you're a tinkerer who will do the upgrade <laughs> yourself. I mean, don't fool yourself. <laughs> Think you're going to buy an old PC and be okay. Right. Thanks so much for being with us, Robin. We'll be back right after these messages. Don't go away. Yeah, I wonder. The Home Bureau at thesite.com gives you news about kids, health, hobbies, and money. Learn about everything from low-rate credit cards to the best deals in health clubs. That's every Monday night at the Home Bureau at the site.com. Next on NBC at 1700 National Geographic. Tonight at 2200, it's the NBC Night Show. At 2200, join Jay Leno for The Tonight Show with Mad About You's Paul Reiser and the incredible Cirque du Soleil. At 2300, on Late Night with Conan O'Brien, Yasmin Bleed from Baywatch, with music from Shania Twain. And at midnight on Later, actor-director Ed Burns. That's tonight on the NBC Night Show at 2200 on NBC, where the stars come out at night. Essayist Cliff Stoll is an astronomer, a physicist, and a computer expert. But what does he really think of high technology? Tonight, he finds his answer in his tomato garden. Hey, last spring, I could have spent my Saturdays building my web page and fixing up some files to upload and download from the internet. Instead, planted some tomatoes. Hey, and sure enough, it's tomato season right now. Things have pretty much come off the vine, and hey, there's just two things that you can't buy in life. Love and homegrown tomatoes. People can give it to you, but you can't buy homegrown tomatoes. The difference between the stuff you grow in your own yard and the stuff that you get from, from the grocery store is they breed theirs to have nice thick skins so they can ship, around, ship them around the country and they don't fall apart. The ones you grow at home, mmm, really great. Well, well, this has nothing to do with new media or the culture of the internet. Realize that. Other than to say the flavor, the color, the feel, 
of your own tomato garden. You can't get it online. And a lot of times, people in new media, people in computing think that, oh, what we're doing is real important and transcends everything else going on around us. What I'm trying to say is, don't just be a little bit skeptical of the claims that the internet is the way of the future, but realize that there are wonderful things that some people do, that you do as well as I do, that have nothing to do with computers. Chewing on homegrown tomatoes is one of them. Wandering around the garden is an obvious one. And being with friends and sharing coffee and good times with them is an obvious another one. Well, yeah, of course, this is obvious. My worry is that with our love affair with the internet, our sense of wonderment over the instant communications of the World Wide Web, that we spend so much time behind a keyboard staring at a cathode ray tube that we don't appreciate things like homegrown tomatoes. That's our program for tonight. Coming up tomorrow on the site, we'll take a look at the folks behind the scenes of the Low Res Film Festival. It's low resolution, and it gives new meaning to the words coming in under budget. Craig Miller, of course, will have all the news, and don't forget to visit our website at thesite.msnbc.com or www.thesite.com. I'm Soledad O'Brien. Good night. Seating was a joint production of Ziff Davis Television and NBC News. You're watching NBC, where the stars come out at night. <laughs>